welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, once again, we'll be looking at another immigration case that has found its way in the Supreme Court. And once again, this case concerns Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is the right to private and family life. The full citation of this case is the Crown on the Application of Agiarco and Ikuga and the Secretary of State for the Home Department, and the citation for this case is 2017 UKSC 11. Now the two women in the case Agiarco and Ikuga are two female foreign nationals who were residing unlawfully in the UK. However, during this period of residing unlawfully in the UK, they had found British partners and had started relationships, and so this is where the Article 8 case of having a right to a private and family life comes into play. Those who listened to the podcast last week may remember that we looked at the immigration rules, and once again when we're dealing with situations like this, we have to look at a different part of the immigration rules. In particular, paragraph EX.1b of Appendix FM. And basically it sets out two requirements for these relationships. Firstly, and probably most obviously, the relationships themselves have to be genuine. And secondly, there have to be insurmountable obstacles to family life or that relationship existing outside of the UK. In other words, even if you are in a genuine relationship with someone, if it's possible for that relationship to continue outside of the UK, then the deportation can still go ahead. You may also remember from the case that we discussed last week that there was some discussion about whether the immigration rules actually took into account Article 8 of the European Convention. Last week there was the idea that the rules only paid lip service to Article 8 and didn't actually do anything about it. This can't really be said to be the case this week though because there is also the possibility of exceptional circumstances where leave to remain can be granted in order to ensure that compatibility exists. As has already been hinted at, the Secretary of State made the decision that the two women who were the appellants in this case did not have leave to remain in the UK and were therefore ordered to leave. They appealed against this decision on the basis of the rules that we've already discussed in relationship to the relationships that they had built up with their partners in the UK. However, this argument that they have put forward was rejected throughout the immigration tribunals and also in the Court of Appeal before it reached the Supreme Court as we're discussing it today. When the Supreme Court actually came to its judgments, they as usual started by looking at Article 8 and making a note that this is a proportional right. In other words, we have to balance the rights of the individual on the one hand, i.e. the rights of the appellants in this case, with the public interest on the other hand, i.e. the wider idea that the UK is allowed to have an immigration policy and that it can be as harsh as it wants to be within certain parameters as long as it's not affecting those individual rights. It's within this context that the Supreme Court examined the phrase of insurmountable obstacles, which is the phrase that's actually used in relation to the idea that a relationship can actually continue outside of the UK. I think that for a lot of people this might seem like a harsh rule. I think that maybe many people are aware of the sham relationships that exist and people try to concoct in order to remain in the UK, and people may even get married in order to sort of fulfil that. But I think a lot less people are unaware that even if that relationship can then continue outside of the UK, then the people will have to do so. There wasn't really much of a discussion about whether it was a genuine relationship, although Ms Ikuga couldn't really prove that she lived with her partner. So to get back to the point, a lot of people would say that this idea of insurmountable obstacles is really quite harsh and would definitely limit a lot of people who are in genuine relationships. Insurmountable obstacles is quite a narrow phrasing and so unless there are real genuine Article 8 concerns or there's possibly a threat to other human rights of the individual, then it's unlikely that the argument will be made successfully 
on the basis of the genuine relationship alone. The court somewhat acknowledged that this was a bit of a harsh rule. The court nevertheless pushed on and said that even where this harsh rule is in place, as long as it does meet the criteria of being in line with Article 8 and the Convention in general, and its interpretation does match up with the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, then such a rule, even though it's harsh, will be allowed because it is within the parameters of human rights law. So this really did for the appellants in the first instance because this idea of a first test where there's a genuine relationship and there's no insurmountable obstacles to the relationship continuing outside the UK, those rules were allowed to stand. However, we also have to remember that there's the idea of exceptional circumstances as well, which means that where there are these exceptional circumstances as defined, then leave to remain will be granted. And so the appellant's arguments moved on to this sort of secondary test. The definition of exceptional, as the court pointed out, does not mean something that is unique or unusual, but means circumstances in which refusal for leave to remain would result in disproportionately harsh consequences for the individual. This inclusion within the definition of the idea of proportionality about balancing the rights of the individual against the needs of society is something that played well into the court's hands and so when they came to make their decision they said that this application of this exceptional circumstances test was completely within the remit of human rights law and article 8. So overall then the Supreme Court also unanimously dismissed the appeal and all seven judges agreed in this particular case. The practical effect of this is that the immigration rules will remain exactly the same in terms of how they deal with these relationships. There has to be a genuine relationship in the first instance, there has to be insurmountable obstacles to the relationship continuing outside of the UK, or alternatively there have to be exceptional circumstances that apply in a particular situation. Perhaps it's useful then, as I've sort of hinted at, to compare the case that we're looking at this week with the case that we looked at last week that also concerned immigration, the immigration rules, and Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. As I mentioned, in the case last week, lip service was paid within the immigration rules to Article 8, but there was no real practical application of human rights law. This week we're seeing quite a different set of circumstances where the rules themselves not only mention and explicitly reference Article 8, or at least the ideas that exist within Article 8, but also give practical effect to human rights law by mentioning things like proportionality and also exceptional circumstances, which does leave the gate open for human rights cases to come through. In other words, the government's immigration law may be incredibly harsh, but as long as it shows a willingness to engage with the practical application of the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, then it will be allowed to stand and will meet the criteria that's set out by the court system and the Supreme Court in this particular case. It's not always especially interesting within these podcast episodes to do immigration law every week. It would be nice to have something of a variety. But as the case law builds up around the government's immigration policy and in particular the immigration rules, we can really start to get a picture of how the courts are responding to it and also how the courts are actually responding to human rights arguments within the latest policy round. The courts, as we would expect, are not exactly looking at the efficacy of the policy itself or how good or bad it is in terms of curbing immigration to the UK. One thing that the last two cases we've looked at do have in common is that they do contain references to rules that may well be considered harsh. The courts, however, have not appeared phased by this. They are only interested in how those rules are actually applied. If, as is the case this week, due diligence and practical effect is actually given to the European Convention, then the courts will generally leave well alone. They're confident in saying that the decision makers are basing their decisions and taking into account human rights jurisprudence. On the other hand, as we saw last week, 
where it's only lip service that is actually paid to the European Convention. It will be up to the courts to step in and to place their authority over the case and say, actually, these rules are not drafted correctly because they do not give a practical effect to human rights law. The proportionality then that we talk about is not really about the proportionality of the policy itself and balancing the rights of the UK against those of the individual applicant, but rather the allowing for proportionality to exist within those decision-making frameworks of, say, the immigration official or, officially, the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Well, thank you very much for once again tuning into the UK Law Weekly podcast. I do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to subscribe on iTunes and also leave a review as well. These podcasts are also available on my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver. They come out on podcast form on Monday and on YouTube on Wednesday. So make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you want to catch them early. Also, if you do subscribe to my channel on YouTube, you'll be well aware that I also do law lectures on there. So if that's something that you're interested in, make sure you do check that out. I've been hoping to do quite a few more recently, but work has been immensely busy for me. um, And so that hasn't really been possible, although I'll hope to have another video up next week. Right, that's quite enough of me blathering on, so as my usual, I will give my thanks to bensound.com who provide the theme music for this podcast, and I will let you get on with your day. Thanks very much for listening. Bye!